I've always wondered, do vegetarians eat animal crackers? If a number two pencil's so popular, why is it still number two? Do bald people get dandruff? Why are power outages reported on TV? That makes no sense. But some questions are more meaningful than others. How do I handle all the stress in my life? How do I discover God's will for my life and live it out every day? I have a hard time dealing with disappointment. What does the Bible say I should do? How can I be the parent my kids need me to be and the one God wants me to be? What does the Bible say about dealing with difficult people? Because I know some. Are we actually living in the end times? What does that mean for me? So we turn to the one who has all the answers. We'll examine some of our biggest questions and discover God's best plan. Why? Because you asked for it. All right, we're doing a series. We're in the latter part of the series. Uh, basically, what we did on Easter Sunday, uh, just for those of you who've never been here before, on Easter Sunday, a lot of people show up on church. At the, if everyone shows up at once, it, it's really, really crowded. We had over 700 people that day we handed a survey out to, and a tremendous amount of people responded to the survey. And we collected those, and we asked a question, what is something you would like to hear about? What topics interest you? We, and uh, a number of you filled them out. And as a result of that, we've designed a series to answer the questions that were most important to you. Thus, you asked for it. And uh, last week, we spoke about how can you know God's will, which I think is an awesome question to ask. Well, this week is a question is, how do I understand the Bible? And I think, uh, you know, a lot of us, we're going to get into that in a few moments. And, and the following, uh, in the couple, last two weeks of the series, we're going to deal with something called, you asked the question, how do I deal with difficult people? And uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. That's coming. And then the final message is going to be this. Are we, uh, how do I handle the last days? What's the deal with the last days? Pre-trib, post-trib, no-trib? What, what's the deal with that? How do we live? In the, are we in the last days? What's going on with Putin and Israel? And all? I'm going to have all the answers for you. I'm going to have it all figured out. <laughs> okay, I'm joking. All right. But that's going to be coming as well. So I'm excited about that. All right. So that's what's happening. And then we're going to get into a new series called Flourish, um, and which is going to be a great series as well. The purpose why you're alive. And I think you really enjoy it. So today is all about how you asked the question, how do I understand the Bible? And maybe some of you have struggled with this. I know I did. People keep on telling me, you need to read the Bible. You need to read the Bible. Okay. I open the Bible. I'm like, Okay, what does this have to do with anything? Don't boil a mother's goat in its milk. Um, this person did this, this beget this person, this beget this person. And I'm sitting there, thee, thou, I don't understand. I went through a period of my life where like, gee, what does this all say? And then you come to church, you hear a topic in Matthew, then you hear Mark, then you hear Luke, and you're like, well, what, well how does this all fit together? And you can get kind of frustrated. And, and, but the truth is, a lot of people struggle with understanding the Bible. But I have some good news for you. The good news is that God wants you to understand the Bible, and it's not some secret knowledge. You don't have to get a certain type of degree and get a certain type of light, and, and then maybe it comes out like spy text or something. It, it's not about that. There is no secret knowledge. It's right there in front of you. I want to sh help you today. Real pragmatic, real practical. If you're looking for a deep theological sermon, not this week, okay? But basically, if you're looking for something practical that you can take home and start today and tomorrow, then this is a sermon for you because I, I, uh, I don't know about you, but I find it very important that I'm only as good as how much time I spend in God's Word. Uh, what's so interesting is this, that the Christian Booksellers Association asserts that 90% of U.S. homes have at least one Bible, and about 70% have more than one Bible. So 90% of Americans today in the United States have Bibles. It is the greatest selling book every year. They don't, they don't report it anymore because they're tired of reporting it. But the Bible is the greatest seller in all its translations. So we hear about the Bible. And, uh, and a lot of people in our society today, when, I was, when you were growing up perhaps, Bible used to be in schools. They used to teach Bible in schools before 1964. Okay, and so people knew about the Bible. People would say the Bible says. There was a general uh, understanding of the Bible. Whether you believe it or not, people knew what the Bible is. Well, a little while ago, a Christian, a Christian uh, late night host, uh, he just uh, came off the air about a year ago. His name is Jay Leno. You might have heard of him. He had a, a really funny segment called Jaywalking. And what he would do is he'd go out and he'd go to a college campus with his recorder and then ask questions to people. And they asked the people about the Bible. And this is some of the answers they got. I'm reading the transcript here. Uh, you know, he said, he asked that, zero to ten. He asked people about the Bible knowledge, that they might 
uh, be at an all-time low, and Jay Leno likes to prove it every now and then. He went out. This is what he said. He said, um, can you name, he went on the street, can you name one of the Ten Commandments, he asked. Two college women said, freedom of speech. This is a college university campus. One of the greatest commandments is freedom of speech. Leno uh, said the other one, uh, in another complete sentence, he says, finish his sentence. Let he, who is, let he who is without sin, what is it? What is it? Cast the first stone. You know what she said? Let he who is without sin have a good time. <laughs> then finally, he turned to a young, another young man. He says, who according to the Bible was eaten by a whale? And he said, Pinocchio. So, <laughs> first of all, it says big fish, not a whale. But there's a lot of ignorance out there about the Bible today. People don't know what it really is. And in fact, the church itself, alarmingly enough, they did a survey about an evangelical churches. Uh, evangelical simply means they believe in the Bible. Okay, so we're part of an evangelical. I hate using tape labels because I don't like to be compartmentalized. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. I believe the whole Bible is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is what we teach. We're part of different associations, but that's the bottom line. You see, but nevertheless, they did some studies of, um, this is really interesting, people that graduated uh, high school and then went to youth group, not in our church. And so I asked them, what, what is the Bible all about? They said, well, the Bible is about is about God, and he t tells us how to do good things and how to treat people right, and uh, all you have to do is ask Jesus in your heart, and, and then you do the best you can, and God's happy with you. Now, that's kind of, and, th and this, was a, this was a survey given, and that was a response, the type of responses people were given, but you know what? That's not the gospel. The gospel is that mankind fell from God and they cannot save it. We broke relationship with God. There had to be a payment for our sins through Jesus Christ. And we're not saved by good work, but we're saved by what he did on the cross. And that God loves us and wants us to become in contact with him. And the only way through God is through Jesus Christ. And so a lot of people don't get it, unfortunately. And so sometimes you hear a sermon here, a sermon there. How do you grow in Christ? Now, let me ask you a question this morning. If, if, imagine this, imagine that on Sundays, we do feed you if you go to 301, you don't want to miss it. Imagine that on Sundays we would feed you food, a nice big buffalo chicken, uh, let's say a, bu a buffet of all kinds of great food. You come once a week and you eat and eat and eat and eat, and then the rest of the week you wouldn't eat at all. How many you think you'd be healthy? Okay, you're honest and I appreciate that. Give that man a candy bar. All right. <laughs> but seriously, you could, not, you could not survive that way, could you? But sometimes as believers in Christ, we think if we just come to church on Sunday and have one course, it's going to hold us. Listen, I want to help you to understand a couple of things. If you think this is going to be about a sermon about how bad you are and how God's upset with you, this is the wrong church. This is not about that. What this is about is the Bible is God's love letter to you. I remember being, um, I feel funny saying this because I didn't marry this woman, but anyhow, I had a girlfriend at one time. This is a long time ago, okay? This is when, back in the dark ages before they had electricity. Uh, I had a girlfriend um, that was um, in my early years of being an, uh, a young adult, uh, before I was 20, and, you know, we went on a summer vacation, and, uh, and she would write me letters. And so I would run to, this is before email, <laughs> Uh, I mean, pagers weren't even going on yet. I mean, this is old. This is when we had rotary phones. Okay, we had cassettes, these little plastic things. You, okay. Anyhow, so uh, she would write me, and I would wait by the mailbox on the summer vacation and get it, and I'd smell it. And she'd put this, this disgusting perfume, which I thought was great, and I'd, I'd put my group of Fabergé on mine and send it to her. And, and I'd be reading these letters, and, and, and I'd be like, oh my gosh, I'd read it, and I'd get so excited about reading this letter. And then she'd write something like this, I'm so glad that we're friends. I'm like, what? What's going on? Well, she just wants to be friends? Is she breaking up with me? Then I would be in anxiety, wondering what happened. I couldn't get a hold of her. And then I'd write a letter, and then she'd write another one back, and you, you know what I'm talking about. Okay. Well, later on, we get text messages. My wife and I text each other throughout the day, and I can't repeat some of the texts that she sends me because it's very wonderful. But anyhow, um, so it's fun to have communication with each other and love. Oh, perfect, uh, perfect, perfect, perfect. 
<laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> okay. Put a passcode on your phone. Okay. Anyhow, uh, but we tell each other we love each other and, you know, and, and say, hey, I'm thinking of you and all that kind of thing. And it just something makes your heart leap. There's something about text messaging. There's something about writing letters. You know what I'm saying? And you know what? The Bible is, is kind of like that. People often say, well, the Bible is basic instructions before leaving earth, B-I-B-L-E. And so this is an owner's manual to help you navigate through life. This tells you how to have a good marriage, and all that is true. But there's one component missing in that definition. It really is not a rule book, though it has rules. It's really not an instruction manual, though it has instructions. The Bible is a love letter from God to you and to me. The book of Genesis all the way to the Revelation is about God wanting to reestablish a broken relationship with people he's created in his image and whom he loves. That's really what the Bible's about. That's the premise. For God so loved the world, he came to educate us. No. God loved the world that he wants to, us to know him, not just to educate us, but to know him. And so that's all part of the Bible. And many people are intimidated by the Bible. They get scared. And in the dark ages, I'm going to have to, I went off a little bit. Let me get back in my, my outline or I'll be going all afternoon. But in the dark ages, there was a time where you, the only people that understood the scripture were the priests. And you'd have, to go to the, you'd have to go to the church and you'd have to hear the priest tell you what the Bible meant. And later on, they spoke in a different language in Latin. You're sitting there and people did not have available to them. But then the Gutenberg press happened uh, and, and Martin Luther and all, and everything began to happen. The Bible got in the hands of ordinary people whom, in which it was intended to do. And revival happened in society because people got to read the Bible for themselves. You see, this is not some secret knowledge. This is for you to understand. And, you know, when I first got out of seminary, I used to try to give the Greek and the Hebrew. I'm like, you know what? I don't want to do that. I want to tell people they can do this too. This is something you can do. You can understand the Bible. And that's what we're going to talk about today. All right? The Bible is a love letter written by God to you. And the Bible is the greatest love story ever told. And you are one of the characters God wants to be for you to be in. You see, the problem is that there was an evangelical church in Jesus' day, and evangelical would mean Bible-believing, uh, Bible-toting Christians that believe the Word of God. You better follow the Word of God. Then you had another group of people called Sadducees, and they didn't believe in the resurrection, and they were the liberal church of their day, and they, they believed in good social justice, but they didn't believe in the salvation. They didn't believe all that kind of stuff. And the Pharisees would be like the evangelical, Bible-believing fundamentalists today. They believed the Bible of their day. And in fact, they memorized, check this out, the first five books of the Old Testament. Just take Genesis to Deuteronomy, that, with all those rules, all those regulations, all those ceremonial rules, they had it all memorized. Can you imagine? These people were bright, they were, well, they were studious. And Jesus came, and guess what happened to them? They missed it. And this is what Jesus said. He says this, you search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. But you're not willing to come to me that you may have life. In other words, they miss the point of the letter. Instead of knowing Jesus, they wanted to know about what it said about God. Listen, when you read the Bible, don't read it to get information. Read it to have a relationship. You read the Bible to know God, not to get information. Okay? I mean, yes, you get information. But this is written for us to know God. I read it to know God. So it's not like, you better read the Bible. How are we going to get back to the Bible? You know, I, I, I'm all cool with that, but that's not why he wrote it. God wants us to get back to the Bible because he loves us. And he has a way of doing things, and he wants us to know his ways. The Bible says the following in Psalm 119, 102, 104. I haven't turned away from your regulations, the psalmist says, 
for you have taught me well. How sweet your words taste to me. They are sweeter than honey. Your commandments give me understanding. No wonder I hate every false way of life. Does that sound like a legalistic to-do list? No. It's God says, your words are like honey to me. It sounds like a love letter. When I get that, that letter from you, it's like honey to me. It, it in, invigorates my soul. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3.16, this is the Apostle Paul talking to the young Timothy, young pastor. He says this, all Scripture is inspired by God. It is profitable for doctrine, which doctrine is the right way to know about things, okay? For reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every work. I like what Eugene Peterson says. This is a paraphrase, but I think he does a good job in gathering the intent of the passage. This is what he says. Uh, I like how he says it. Every part of Scripture is God-breathed and is useful one way or another, showing us truth, exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, training us to live God's way. Through the Word, we're put together and shaped up for the task God has for us. I think it's kind of a neat way. I know we don't like the message, but I like it in that particular thing. So basically, the Word of God is to help us and to help instruct us, to help us to know the difference between right and wrong, but even more importantly, to have a life relationship with God. You see, you can read the Bible and attack people. I, I can quote the same scripture and whack people over the head with it. That's not why it's given to us. It's given as a love letter. And sometimes love protects and has to be more assertive. But it says in Hebrews 4.12, For the Word of God is living. The Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow. It is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. I remember reading a story about a pastor friend of mine told me a per person he knew that read that scripture that had bone cancer, and when he read the thing, it goes to joints and marrow. He says, God, heal my cancer, and he was healed of cancer. Pretty cool. I mean, the Word of God is powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's the words of God given to us. Okay, we, we've established that, I believe. But now, now the question is this. How do I get to understand the Bible? Okay, great. I know I need to read the Bible. I understand that. I can't eat once a week. But I read the Bible, and I open it up. And goodness, if you've ever tried this, I've tried it too. I, I've opened the Bible. I'm sitting there reading, and I'm reading something in the Bible. I'm going through it. And I read the following. I read in Deuteronomy uh, 23, 12 to 14. I'm reading one day. It says, also, you shall have a place outside the camp where you may go out, and you shall have an implement among your equipment. And when you sit down outside, you shall dig it with it and turn over your rough use. For the Lord your God walks in the midst of your camp to deliver you and give your enemies over to you. Therefore, your camp shall be holy, that he may see no unclean thing among you, and turn you away. Sounds like a, taking a dog for a walk. What is that supposed to mean? And you read that like, this doesn't relate to me. Incidentally enough, I read that scripture and it actually spoke to me. So now I flushed the toilet. But anyhow, that was bad. Really bad. But anyhow, uh, the, but seriously, what, what basically that, that, that scripture taught me something else later on. It taught me that God is holy and we are to treat him with holiness. But you read that, you're like, what does that have to do with anything? I don't get it. I don't understand what it's supposed to mean. How am I supposed to, to learn about it? How am I supposed to, or you try to read the Bible and you sit there and you start falling asleep. Oh, oh okay, okay. You ever happened to you? This is what's happening. When I try to read the Bible, it's like everything comes against me. Now, I'm not suggesting the enemy comes and there's a demon at my door. No, not talking about that. I'm talking, the enemy's smarter than that. He understands if he came to me head on, I would know it was him. And I would say, oh, get away from me, the enemy, right? But instead, what happens? I get a text message from Associated Press about something about what Putin is doing or whatever. And of course, I want to see what happens. Or, or I'll get a text or I'll get a phone call from somebody. Or, oh my gosh, I got to call Aunt Martha in South Dakota. She just got out of her surgery for an ingrown toenail. I better call her until I love her. So I'll, I'll think of something like that. I'll, I'll think of uh, some kind of thing I need to do. Oh, I need to pay. Oh, I need to pay the, uh, I, need to, I need to pump the sewage tank. Oh, I need to do this. And you start thinking of all these things that you have to do. 
right? Does ever happen to you? And you're constantly interrupted. The kids come in, they fall off their bicycle, they skin their knee, they're crying. You're trying to read the Bible, and then you help them out, and then someone else, can you help me with this? And you get a phone call from somebody else, help me. And what happened? Your Bible time is sabotaged. You don't read the Bible the rest of the day. Ever happened to you? I believe the enemy does these things. I'm not saying your kids are from the devil, okay? But I believe God will use these little gnats to get you off track. Because it's that important that you and I get into the Word of God. Well, how do we, how do we know the Word of God? Let me give you some practical things, okay? So here we go. I know it's not very deep, but this is pretty practical. What you have to do is this. Understand this. If you don't set a time and a place to read the Word of God, it probably won't happen. Because something else will compete for your time, and it's just, gonna, it's just always something to do. Especially now that we're connected constantly to the world through our our devices, right? There's always something to do. You have to set a time and a place that's non-negotiable. This is an appointment like going to work. Well, I just like to flow by the Spirit, and I don't, I don't like those regulations. God's not at rules and regulations. I understand God's not rules and regulation. but imagine this. Imagine you get hired at a job and say, what are you doing? I'm going to work today. When? Let's make a difference where I go to work. As long as I go to work, if I get around to it, how many people would be able to have a job? Right? If you have a job, you have to have a place and a time. Right? If you're going to study the Word of God, I encourage you to set a time and a place. If you do not do this, my friends, I will tell you, and you know what I'm talking about, something else will sabotage your time. So you have to make it a priority in your life. And by the way, it's a priority so you can love God and hear from God. Yeah, but I don't understand what I'm reading, so why bother? Well, just hold on. I'll tell you how in a few moments. You're going to be a Bible scholar and you'll know Greek and Hebrew before you leave here today. I'm joking, okay? That's not going to happen, okay. But anyhow, so set a time and place. I love what the Bible says, Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet, a light into my path. Now, winter's coming. I hate to tell you that, all right? And if you have your car outside at night, sometimes it snows. Does this ever happen to you? you the, the weather reports like it's going to be fine. You wake up in the morning, there's two inches of ice on your windshield. You have to get the kids to the school bus, or you have to go to work, or have to go to college, or whatever you have to do. So, oh my goodness, you just go outside, you, you crack open the door, you turn the car on, and you start scraping away, and you get a little porthole, a little, little porthole. I'm like, man, I don't have time for this to defrost. So you back up, and you're driving through like this, trying. Am I the only one that's ever done that? You're sitting there, you say, I can't see. And you put down, and you, 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 you make your spouse, well, don't shut the window, I can't see. And you're trying to drive through here, and you, you can't get through because you haven't taken the time to defrost the, the, the window. How many of us go into our day without defrosting our minds, without defrosting our hearts? You see, every single day, stuff gets on us. And the Word of God, what it does, it's like a great defroster that gets the windshield of your life clear so you can see where you're going and the right way to go. Otherwise, you're limited the scope of what you can do. That's the beauty. You don't have to. You get to. And so by reading the Word of God, it helps you see clearer and navigate through the life that God has called you to do this. So the first thing is this. Set a time and a place. Second thing is this. Get a translation you understand. Now let's back up for a minute because unfortunately today, people are taking the Bible and changing it. There's a genderless Bible, a PC Bible. So when it talks about, our, for example, the Lord's Prayer, our mother and father who art in heaven. I mean, that's just, that's just taking the original Greek, original Hebrew, original Aramaic, and that's just twisting it. We're not supposed to do that. Okay, when you start doing that, that's not good. And there's some other versions, they really break it down to such a point, people say, I, you know, I don't know which Bible to trust. And, and rightfully so. There's some translations out there just frankly bad. But I've heard people say to me, I only, I'm a King James only. And I'm like, okay. If it, the person told me this. I'm not making this up. If it was good enough for the Apostle Paul, is it good enough for me? Uh, I said, sir, I don't know if you realize. Be quiet, okay? Uh, first of all, the Bible was not written in King James. It was in 1610 or 11. It came out by the Church of England. It was commissioned for that. The Bible was originally written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And so people had to translate it to the English. First it was in Latin, then it was in German. Then we got to English. So some of the, and, and some of the translations from the King James Version, I'm not coming against it. It's a good translation. But there's, we have found older manuscripts than what was used for the King James Version. Older, the older the manuscript, 
the more accurate it is to the rich. And, and, and so, you know, King James Version, as good as it is, no one talks that way. It sounds good at Shakespeare. And the beauty is when I grew up with it, I memorized it, and it was fine. Now today, there's so many translations. I'm thinking, what's translation is good? Well, let me uh, encourage you a couple that I, I believe are good based upon, I did take ancient Hebrew, I did take Greek. I'm by no mean am I a scholar. I'm better at Greek than I am Hebrew. But I, I know enough to look into the, the original languages and look it up and do the grammar and figure out the verb tense. So I did all that study. And I, this is what I found, and not only me, but other scholars. Also, I'm not a scholar, but I try to be a good student. A good versions of the Bible you can trust. Uh, the New King James Version is a good version. Uh, the English Standard Version is a good version. There's some good ones out there. Now, there's the New Living Translation, which I like for devotional reading. And I, I like to read it because it's easy to read. But if I really want to study hard, I, I don't look at that only. I, I would go back to, the, to a New American Standard or New King James or English Standard Version. Or I actually break open to, you know, uh, I open, get my computer open and look at the actual words and look at the verb tense and the whole thing. So I can't do all. I understand you can't do that. But at least it's good to have a couple of good Bibles that, you, that are more... Um, authentic to the original language. Some are literally like this. And make no mistake, when you have a translation, some stuff is lost. There's certain jokes in Spanish that don't translate very well. For example, the word love in, in what happens in, in Greek, there's many different words for love. In America, we just say love. Uh, let me say something else. I don't have time to this morning to tell you all the nuances of Scripture, but on July 5th, if you go to cornerstonecheshire.com, on July 5th, you can click on the sermon there, and I talk about how can you trust the Bible, and I deal with the authenticity of the Bible, I deal with the history of the Bible, and all that. So I'm not going to do that right now. Today's primary purpose is to say, how do I understand the Bible? And so you understand about the Bible by reading something you understand. So find a good translation you understand but under, okay is that clear everybody okay um, and there's some good ones out there and there's some bad ones out there I've just told you a couple of good ones I've a couple of other good ones NIV is okay I'm not crazy about it T today's NIV uh, I'm not crazy about it. it changes too much of the original when it starts taking the original and changing pronouns from masculine pronouns and neutral pronouns that's not what the Bible meant okay now, for example, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. So if any person is in Christ, he's a new creation. You, you see the difference? There's that that's going on, which is kind of... Then you have the whole thing about uh, our God and Father who are in heaven. Our God and Mother who are in heaven. So find a good translation. Number one, find a place and time, non-negotiable. Number two, get a good translation you understand. And number three... In order to understand the Bible, this is really deep. You want to write this down. In order to understand the Bible, you have to... You guys are so good. In order to understand the Bible, you have to read the Bible, even if you don't understand what it says sometimes. There's sometimes I don't understand what it's talking about, but I read every day, read every day, and I go back and study later on. Heard a story of a, of a young um, high school he was ready to graduate. He went to a Bible camp, and he, if they memorized, uh, the, they memorized a passage of the Scripture, they would get a prize. And he was very competitive, and so he memorized the Scriptures. And then later on, he fell away from God, started being a football player, and he, he passed out on the field and woke up on the hospital bed, almost died. And all of a sudden, the Scriptures he learned in high school started coming back to him, and it ministered to him, and he ended up giving his life to Christ and had the peace of God with him. Because of something he read, my word will not return void. So sometimes you need to read the Bible, and there's been times I've read the Bible, and it comes out of nowhere. I'll be in a situation, an airplane, or talking to somebody, and stuff comes up. Have you ever noticed what you read in the morning sometimes? It, it's really pertinent to what you're going through that day. It's pretty neat. you got to read the Bible. Okay? Set a time and place, get a translation you understand, and actually read the Bible. And this is part of the important of it. And once you've done that, well, once you start reading, there's some ways to learn how to understand, okay? We picked up a couple of things, okay? Now I'm going to talk about some things you can do to help you understand the Bible. We talked about finding a time, a place, a translation, and actually you start reading. Now, how do you understand? The first thing I want to encourage you to do is this, in the study of it. Ask the Holy, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, ask the Holy Spirit to open your eyes, the Bible says in John eleven twenty six, 26, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, if you put that scripture up, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father, that's John 14, 26, 
But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all the things that I said to you. And so the Holy Spirit will help you. All right, so ask the Holy Spirit. Number two, read the Bible as if it was the very first time you read the passage. We come with so many prejudices when we read the Bible. This is why people could read the Bible and condone slavery, the, the, the atrocity that happened in America, in the colonies, and even in England and France, you name it. Why? They read the Bible with their eyes. They had this wrong perception of Noah and Ham and who Ham was and who the descendants of Ham were. They got it wrong. And because they had their tradition, they read it through that guise. Come to the scriptures as if you've never read it before. Come with clear eyes. Okay, and this is another thing I encourage you to do. When you read the Bible, don't read the commentary first. I know a lot of you have the Bibles, you have the commentaries on the bottom. You're just reading what Schofield said. Why not read the Bible first? However, however, you need to understand the context in which it was written. Now you're going, this is overwhelming. No, it's not. Hold on, okay? It's not overwhelming. Let me tell you a story. I heard this this past week. I have a dear friend of mine. He was at work, and he was talking to another colleague, and his colleague's wife went away, and he started doing the family chores and doing taking care of the laundry. And so he was, you know, he was taking the laundry, and he was trying, he ruined some awesome clothes. He took the colored, colored um, uh, um, laundry along with the white, and it turned pink and blue. He screwed them all up. And so he recognized that, and here's a grown man, probably in his 40s by now, finally gets it. And so he's telling my friend, he's saying, you know what I discovered? And he's getting all animated. You know what I discovered? You can't put the colors with the whites. It just doesn't work. It causes problems that are irreversible. You cannot put the colors with the whites. When am I, I should have known that. I, how dumb of I? I can't. And all of a sudden, an African-American guy walks in. He's like... Well, anyhow, and the guy was offended because he heard him say it again, you know. So he had to explain, no, no, we're talking about laundry. Yeah, sure you are. So, you know, it's so easy to come on in the middle of a conversation and hear something and get it out of context. You need to wor- read the Word of God in context. And one of the ways you read it in context is you have to read not just one verse, but read where it comes from. There's something they teach you in real estate. It's all location, location, location. Well, in Bible interpretation, to understand the Bible, you need to understand the location, where it's located. Now, I understand many of you cannot read through the Bible in the whole way. I was just having a conversation with another gentleman this past week about, Bible, uh, about Bible, uh, understanding the Bible. This is what I learned in seminary. What you do in seminary, I learned, if you want to understand the Bible, I read through the whole book. One shot. Take a, like, if I'm going to buy a piece of land, you might take an aerial view. Now, we have Google Maps. In the old days, you'd have to buy, hire an airplane. You'd go over, and you get a, a big idea of it by flying over or looking at a geological map and you see where the ravines are like when we before we built this church we had to get it surveyed and we had to have an aerial view we had to know the evolutions um evolutions of the different parts of the property okay then we had a, a big scope of it then you can land the plane now you have to walk through it and you can go through every area and learn it more but you need to have a broader context so when you read in a letter, the apostle of Philippians, for example, you want to st- I'll give you an example. You want to learn a good book of the Bible, start reading, start with Philippians. Read it through one time. Take it 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes tops. You read through the whole thing at once. Don't stop, just keep reading. And you'll get a general idea of what it's about. Now you can go back and go slower, and the passage has a little more meaning. The beauty of it is this. If you're not a big reader, a lot of us have smartphones and stuff. You can get a Bible app. There's a wonderful church called um, Life Church, uh, Craig Rochelle's church, tremendous man of God, and he has this app called the Version. And so you can download that for free and you can and put it on your computer if you have an internet connection, and you can click it and they'll read the Bible to you. So you can be driving your car here in the book of Philippians. And then you go home, you start reading it. You see that? And then you also have to understand the context. And Paul was written to a Philippian, well, I'm overwhelmed. I can't do all that. That's okay. Just start where you are. A good study Bible might have a little bit of explanation what was going on at the time of the book, when it took place. And so you read about Philippians. He's talking to a church. Okay? And the Bible was written very, very clearly. It was not in code. There's no secret codes of the Bible. 
Oh, I found the secret code. I know when Christ is coming back. No, you don't. It sells books, but it's not true. The Bible is for the common people because it's a love letter for you and I to understand. Okay? Remember, take a time. Time and a place. All right? It's very, very important. And non-negotiable. That's all part of it. And um, <clears throat> get a translation you understand and start reading and then don't ask the Holy Spirit. And then read the Bible as if it's your first time. A lot of us come to the Bible with traditions. I grew up um, Pentecostal. I grew up Southern Baptist. I grew up uh, Seventh-day Adventist. I grew up Sixth-day Adventist. I grew up First-day Adventist. There's no such thing. I'm making things up. But I, I grew up a certain way. And I've always been taught this is the way it's supposed to be. And I read it with that guise. Put that aside and go to the Bible as if it's your first time. I'm telling you, do that. And you'll be amazed how your theology that you have will be challenged. My theology is really challenged lately. I've been reading through the Old Testament. Help the poor. Help the poor. Help the poor. Help the poor. Constantly, my God, what are we doing in our church to help the poor? We've got to do more to help the poor, not just throw money at them. What can we do, God? It's God's heart. It's God's heart. So we're, gonna re we're reaching out more to the poor and helping those that can't help themselves. Why? Because the Scripture talks about it. Right? Israel's judged for not taking care of the poor. We have a responsibility to do such. We can't wait for the government to do it. That's our job as believers. So I read that. I'm like, whoa, i got to start doing that. We've got to find ways that are productive to help more people this way. So that's an example of how the Word of God will speak to you. But if all you do is you read the Bible, there's people out there right now, and I'll tell you, there's some grace preachers that are out there right now. I'm not going to mention any names, but all they talk about is the grace of God. There's nothing mentioned about repentance. They pick from here. They pick from there. They pick from here. They don't tell the whole story. It's not, it's not honest. It's male practice. But when you read the Bible, it's clear. So read it and put your theological persuasion aside. Put your Southern Baptist aside. Put your Assemblies of God aside. Put your, put your Catholic Catholicism aside and say, I'm going to read this as if it's my first time. And then you ask the Holy Spirit, all right? We talked about doing that. We talked about... Um, Reading it as if it's the first time and asking God to open your eyes. Okay, don't look at the commentary. That's all part of it. And then understand its original language. We've talked about that. Now, this is what I have done. When I read the Bible, I ask God, would you please show me what you want me to learn today? And what I'll do is I'll underline stuff or I'll highlight stuff in my Bible. Then when I'm done reading the Bible, guess what I do? I'll go back. This is what I do. It works for me. And I'll pray it through. Be anxious for nothing, but with prayer and supplication, make your request known to God. Okay? And I'll go back and pray that. Lord, I'm anxious about X, Y, and Z, uh, but I give it to you, and I'll read something about it. And then I'll underline. Then I'll pray what I just read. And I'll even write down. This is what I, you don't have to do it this way, but this is what I found effective for me. And I'll go through a book like Philippians. I read through the Bible every year. I, I, I love what we do at Cornerstone. We're going to continue to do it until the Lord says do otherwise. What we do, we read through the Bible every year. And uh, we're going to put it on our website again. But what we do is we read the Old Testament, the New Testament, a Psalm, and a Proverb. And I tell you, every day, I usually I get something someplace. It's a blessing. And so I don't cherry pick my passages of Scripture. I go through the whole Bible. Don't just look for just things that deal with prosperity and health. I read the whole thing. And it speaks to me, and I learn a lot. Let me tell you, I, I, if I skip a day, I, I feel it. I used to play trombone. I was a young, a young man. And, uh, and trombone, you have an aperture, and you have to use your, your mouth, and you blow through a, a mouthpiece. Well, let me tell you, that instrument requires a lot of practice. So I used to practice a couple hours a day. It was an all-state band. It was a lot of fun back in the day and all that, and it was fantastic. But if I let up on a day, the, I, my lips would be all sore. If I let up on a week, I wouldn't be able to play well. And if I, I would feel it. With guitar, you can get away with a lot more unless you're doing intricate, set, intricate scales, where I also play guitar. But if I let it go, I get sloppy and rusty. And this is what I have found. The closer I get to God, the more I realize I need God. The faster you go on the road, the more you have to keep your eyes on the road. And I find if I don't read my word of God in that day, I feel it like, oh, man. It's not like I don't feel guilt or condemnation. I miss God. My heart, oh, God, I miss you. I need that time with you, God. I need to be alone. And I'll be honest with you, the worst place to study is sometimes the church. So I'll go off to Mixville. I'll, run, I'll, I'll go to some place. I'll find a quiet place. I'll lock myself in one of the buildings around here and get away from everything, turn the phone off, because I know I'll be interrupted by well-meaning people. 
but I realize it's my life. It's my life. I got to hear my, my father's voice. And so what I'll do is I'll do whatever it takes to hear his voice. So pray what you just read. Now, this is something I just read also. There's studies, multiple studies. You know how you, you, know how you can remember something? People say writing it down. Well, that's good. Memorizing. That's good. But you know the best way to remember something? is to teach what you just learned. One of the benefits I have of being a pastor, by the way, it's a great thank you, by the way, for the opportunity. I get to preach and learn, and what I learned, I get to tell you. And guess what happens to me? It gets branded to me even better. So, well, good thing for you to do is this. When you read the Bible, go share it with somebody. Share it with somebody. You, the Lord says, but fear not, I'm with you. Be not dismayed, I'm your God. You read that. You're like, wow, that, that really encouraged me today. Go share it with somebody. Or maybe today you can go home and, and talk with your spouse or your kids about, hey, I, I just learned some practical things to do so we can read the Bible and get something out of it and re rehearse or reteach what you just learned. You know what happens? It comes back at you. It gets in you. That's, a, that's an important thing. Share helps you do that. All right, so those are some things. Share what you learn and teach others. Now, let me just say some closing conclusions as the worship team gets ready to come back. Let me explain this. God gave us the Bible not to inform us, but to transform us. God did not come to let it give us knowledge about himself. He, gave us, he wants us to know him. So we read the Bible not to know about God. I read the Bible to know God. You see the difference? If I want to know about Sandra, I'll go on her Facebook profile and look at all her pictures. <laughs> and and he, if I, if, if I did, wasn't married to her, let's imagine I just started, I thought, she, you know, I would try to flirt with her again, and we were young and all that, and I went on her Facebook, I, I check, I try to find out, if I find out everything about her, ask questions about her, do I really know Sandra yet? No. I don't know Sandra until I start speaking with her and talking to her, listening to her voice, letting her speak back to me. Scriptures will do that through the power of the Holy Spirit. So I want to encourage you to do that. God gave us the Bible that we might be transformed, not informed only. Am I using my Bible knowledge to point out the sin of others? Woman, you need to submit to me. Is that what it's all about? No. It's about not to point out the sin of others, but to have compassion for more people. Okay. Is there evidence that my biblical knowledge has let have puffed me up? Well, I'll, I, we've seen a lot of this through the years. Well, we, know we're, we flow into spiritual gifts. Those other people don't. I speak in tongues, and they're not, they don't, they're not tongue speaking, so I'm better than they are. Oh, they're, they're ignorant. We know the Bible. We memorize. We study. You know, all this other junk, and we, I'm better than you, and, you know, um, you know, it's like being in a football field. Um, our team's better than you, and you yell back and forth. It's silly. It's not about that. Am I using the Bible to elevate myself? No, it's about knowing God, all right? And, and another thing is this. Am I aware of any underlying motive in my life? Why am I reading the Bible for? I'm reading to know God. Do I have a teachable spirit? And above all, above all, above all, it's my relation. You read the Bible to know and to talk with God himself through Jesus Christ. My friends, the Bible is a love letter written from God to you. Don't, you don't have to read it to know God, know about you. You get to read it so you know God. God wants to know you. So read the Bible to know God, not just know about him. You see the difference? If you read just to know about God, you're gathering facts. No, I want to know God and the power of the God. So I want to encourage you as we conclude is the first thing is this. If you want to, you want to grow from the Bible, it's what you need to do. Have a time and a place that's non-negotiable. Find a time and a place. If you don't, it will not take place. Get a translation you can actually understand. If, you, if King James works, praise God. Okay? Get a translation you understand. Number three, just start reading. Ask the Holy Spirit to open your eyes. Read it as if it's the first time you've come to the passage. Put aside your old ways. It's okay to read what other people say, but first, get it from God first. Read it in context, okay? Read it in context. Don't just pick little scriptures. Read it in its full context. Come to church. Hear other believers. Discuss it. What you learn, share with somebody else. And know that God loves you and desires to know you. Let's pray. 
Lord, I want to thank you so much for your word that you gave us as a love letter for us, that we would know you, God. And Lord, I just pray that you would bless us today, Lord. I pray that we would come to know you. In Jesus' name, with every head bowed, I'm going to ask you a quick question. Some of you are saying, I, I get nothing out of the Bible. You see, one of the key components of understanding the Bible is giving your life to Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says the Holy Spirit will teach you all things. Have you given your life to Jesus Christ? Do you just know about God or do you know God? And so God wants to know you. And let me ask you a question. If you were literally to die today and, and you were going to go to heaven and God would say, why should I let you in? We say, well, I'm a pretty good person. And compared to my neighbor, compared to the other Christian I know, I'm actually better than the Christian down the street. I, I give more money to the poor. I'm more, more gracious than the person at work. It's not about that. You can't save yourself. There's only one way you can get to God, and that's through Jesus Christ. He is the vessel. He is the bridge. Jesus paid a price that you and I cannot pay. You can never be good enough. So you have to give your life to Jesus. Say, life, God, I give my life to you. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. That's how it works. And that's how it begins. And I want to encourage you today. Some of you are just thinking, you know, maybe you've never really given your life. And not only you have to believe, but you say, God, I give my life to you. Jesus says, I'll have no other gods before me. He's, he's either everything or he's nothing. Now, listen, I, I made a decision to follow God a long time ago. But there's times I get back in the driver's seat. But then I know, ooh, what am I doing? God needs to be first, not me. I make a conscious decision. I mess up. And that's okay. That happens. But my question to you, have you ever said, I am no longer in charge, I give my life to God. I'm not going to do what I want anymore, I'm going to do what He wants me to do. If you've never done that, then you're not saved. You're only a follower of a religion. You're only in a, in a, a, someone that admires it. But until you give your life, it's not the same. If you'd like to give your life to Jesus right now, I'm going to pray in a few moments. I'll give you an opportunity. Has everyone just be still, if you could be so kind. And I'm going to ask you a question so I know how I better pray for you. You'd say, Pastor, please pray for me. I want to give my life to Christ. I've never done it. Or I've, I've fallen away. I want to come back. Just see a quick show of hands. Just real quick. Say, Pastor, that's me this morning. I want to thank you. Anybody else this morning? Thank you. Anybody else? Come on. Let's just be honest here this morning. Anyone else? I think there's at least one or two other people. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Praise God. Come on, everyone. Let's thank the Lord. He's working people's hearts. You're going to see in your information packet, there's a connection card. It says, I gave my life to Christ. If you want to fill that out and put it in one of those boxes or come up forward, we'll give you a Bible. We'll get you started in this whole thing. I want to pray a prayer with you now. I'm going to ask everyone to join together. We're going to pray this together. If you pray from your heart, it's a new beginning. Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. Today, I choose to follow you. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. I've just confessed my sins. Your word says that you forgive me through what Jesus did on the cross. Thank you that I am now forgiven. And from this day forward, with your help, I choose to make you the boss, my father, you are it, God. You are the Lord of my life. No longer will I call the shots. I submit my life to you today in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, it's a beginning. I'm going to ask their prayer team to make their way. Let's all stand if we could. I wanted to, I wanted to pray for the rest of you. And I feel like I need to say one more thing. I know I always say that. I need to say one more thing. If you really want to grow in your relationship with Christ, I encourage you to read the Bible every day and pray what you read. Listen, take this home today. Do it, all right? Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I just thank you so much for everyone here. Lord, I pray that we would do the practical thing, Lord. I pray that we would make a non-negotiable time and place with you every day, that we will make sure that every day we get to spend time with the Creator who made all the beautiful leaves outside. We get times to, to spend time with the Creator of all the universe, Lord. And we pray right now that we would leave this place today, that we would make it a priority to set up a time and a place 
Father, that we would find a translation we can actually understand. That we would read it, Lord God. That we would ask for your help, God. And Lord, I just pray that we would grow. That we would be a church that grows and knows your word and knows you more importantly, Lord. Thank you for that today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you need prayer for anything at all, we want to encourage you to come forward. Pray for those that are sick or you want to pray for our loved one. Whatever it is, I'm going to ask you to pray one more song. And if you fill out those cards, you put it in one of those boxes and gave it to one of the prayer team, okay? Go share with someone today that you gave your life to Christ. God bless you.